Much like our own country, the United States is a vast nation stretching between oceans and several time zones, a mixture of different nationalities, cultures and faiths. So how is it that a country with so many seemingly disparate factors came to be so united? Simon Winchester, the author of The Men Who United the States, America's Explorers, Inventors, Eccentrics and Mavericks, and the Creation of One Nation Indivisible, has some ideas on that, and he's here with us again now. Hello, welcome back. That's Hello. quite a title of your book. Uh, yes, I'm afraid it's the done thing these it's, days. Long it's subtitles. Long. It's long. Uh, yesterday we talked about some of these men, over 200 years that helped shape your country, the United States. And, and we talked about the physical uniting of uh, the US, USA. And I know they each had their own individual motivations, and we talked about some of those last night, but was there something sort of uniting their motivations that sent them out the door to go discover and build the country? It's a very interesting question, that. I mean, there was this whole notion of the manifest destiny, that we were, and I say I'm only a new American, but if you can imagine yourself in the 1820s and 30s, you felt it was your God-given, God-directed destiny to find out what this country was made of and make something of it. What interested me particularly in the the early part of that story, I used to be a geologist, and that's what I studied at university and briefly became one. Never very good at it, but I nonetheless have a sort of unyielding fascination in geology. And it was the early geologists who, as it were, set the lures that tempted Americans to come out west, because California was relatively settled relatively early by people that went by sea across Panama and up to the west coast. And they explored the country and found it to be not only climatically agreeable and topographically interesting and very beautiful, but also full of good stuff. I mean, gold at Sutter's Mill, silver at the Comstock Lode in Nevada, beautiful farmland in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. And messages went back to the, you could never call Eastern America, crowded but to people in Eastern America saying, look, there are wonderful things out here. Why not come out and, and settle the land? And as we, as I mentioned in yesterday's program, Jefferson had laid down rules by which Americans could own land. And so states would set themselves up and say, there's land here that you can buy and it is beautiful land. And the geologists are telling, it it's, telling us it's full of potential riches. So, why not come out and see for yourselves? And the phrase went round seeing, I went to see the elephant, which is this elephant in the room, which is this sort of amazing something on the far horizon. And so people, very courageous when you think about it, would from their relatively um, simple houses in let's say Ohio or Illinois or Indiana or Missouri would say, let us, it is our destiny to see the West, and there's all this good stuff there. Let us get a wagon, let us say goodbye to the East, and trek out there. And they did, and they went out on these trails. Many of them died on the way, many of them gave up and came back, but those that made it through found everything to be as the geologists had promised. Okay, noble motivation, but were any of their pursuits, or to what extent were they you know, going out there because of the almighty dollar? Oh, I think there's no doubt about it, at least the opportunity. The opportunity for, and I don't want to get too sort of soppy about this, but I mean for, for self-growth, for improving your life, for improving your lot financially. Yes, I mean, if you're living in a hard scrabble farm in Illinois, say, and you're told that there's untold farmland where you can grow peaches and avocados in California, and by the way, in the hills, there's stories coming out that people are finding gold and iridium and platinum and silver. I would go there. Sign and me I up. Sign, exactly. But, but, um, however difficult it may be. And of course, people like the Donner Party starved in trying to get over the Sierra because the journey was incredibly difficult and they starved and they ate each other. I mean, what was it? 27 people were, died in that uh, appalling expedition. It was a very difficult journey. And those who made it, who were tested, became a unique kind of people uh, and, and, and the, the toughness which we talked about the last time of the frontier experience. They were tested by an extraordinary experience to get there. And you know, the men you talk about physically unite this very vast country and, and amazing s stories about them. Culturally though, 
How would you say, are Americans united culturally by what these men did over these years? Culturally, probably not. I mean, I, because after all, there are so many of them. You go to a city like Chicago or New York, where I live, I mean, true melting pots of thousands of competing, conflicting, uh, but, but mutually energizing cultures. Um, they were spiritually united. I think they believed, going back to that phrase, the manifest destiny and the whole notion of American exceptionalism, the belief that we are somehow different from people in the rest of the world. Um, that united them. But culturally, considering the variety of backgrounds from which they came, no. And I hope that never uh, occurs. I hope they're not become blandly one culture. I would never wish that to, to be the case. And you became an American citizen just three years ago. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your relationship with your adopted country? Well, I came, I think, in a sense, for much the same reason that, that people came in the hundreds of years before me. I wasn't impoverished. I wasn't fleeing persecution or anything like that. But I was turning my back on Britain, for instance, which I believe is still hidebound by a very class-structured uh, country that uh, affords people like me relatively limited, relatively constrained opportunities. And I felt as a writer I could just do much better in America. And I have, and it's caused a lot of chagrin back home. I was in Oxford a couple of years ago, I'd written a book about Alice in Wonderland, and a, a woman came up to me and said, you've become an American, haven't you? And I said, yes, I have. And she said, well, you're a traitor, and I'm never going to buy any of your books again. So there was some hostility to my having gone across the pond. But in America, I'm very much welcomed, mm. I think. They think, why would you want to leave England, the land of Downton Abbey? And I say, because <laughs> I, I wasn't get on living in the upstairs. Because I wasn't upstairs. <laughs> I had to be perpetually down in the kitchen, yeah. Uh, do you still have your British citizenship? I do, and so I, I, I have both passports indeed in my pocket today. I, I want to talk a little bit about that comparison, just for a moment, of, of your, your two countries, of, of Britain and in America. How would you distinguish the unity that you see in America versus unity or disunity that you saw back in Britain? Well, it's a very interesting question, because as you'll probably know, at the moment we're discussing in Britain, uh, and notice I still say we, um, whether Scotland should break off uh, from the United Kingdom. There's a referendum, and uh, it may well be that Scotland, after you know, 250 years since the Act of Union, um, will leave and become its own country. So that's something that interests me, fas uh, really fascinates me, the nature of unity, which got me to write this book in the first place. because. And I mean no disrespect to Canada when I say this, but f of the great countries, the great blocks, B-L-O-C-S, in the world, few of them are truly united. I mean, let's deal with Canada first of all. It is an inalienable fact that the mood of separatism among the Quebecois rises and falls, and is there always a potential threat to Canadian unity that you may be ultimately divided into into three countries. I mean, at the moment, it's not being talked about, but in the 1960s, when I first lived here, it most certainly was. Uh, look at Europe, where I come from. As I said, uh, Britain itself is perhaps not as united a kingdom as it has been since the Act of Union in the 1700s. Look at Europe as a whole. I mean, we in Britain don't use the euro. Switzerland's not a member of the European Union. If you want to plug your electric razor in in Madrid, you're going to need a different plug from the one you use in Stockholm. They're all jabbering away in a variety of different languages. China's unity is only there by force. Russia's unity since the collapse of the Soviet Union manifestly has not happened. I mean, look at Ukraine, look at Belarusia. It's a mishmash of... But America, despite being this extraordinary amalgam of a mongrel country of people from all over the world, has, with the single exception, of course, of the 1860s, managed from Maine to California, from Oregon to Florida, to remain united. How has it done that? It, well, it's, it begs a question. I mean, politically, there is very little unity, some would suggest, in your country. Yet, in other ways, you say it's so unified that there is this feeling of being American that yes. ties it, binds it all together. It, I, I, I want to speak to that idea of, of America and why Americans feel you know, so proud of it and this idea of American exceptionalism. A couple of years ago, President Obama spoke about this. You know, Americans believe in American exceptionalism. They said, you know, much like the, I believe the Brits think of British exceptionalism and the Greeks and so on and so forth. How would you characterize American exceptionalism? Is there anything unique about it 
compared to say, the Brits or the Greeks in, in their beliefs of their own exceptionalism? I think, and you may find this a regrettable answer, it has a lot to do with power. I mean, there is no escaping the fact that America is hugely powerful. It has this idea of itself as being different in that it is a sort of United Nations. Everyone says, you know, when there's a problem in Central African Republic or Bosnia, bring in the United Nations. Well, America is its sort of own United Nations because there are Bosnians and there are refugees from the Central African Republic all uttering their opinions into the great sort of Commonwealth that is America. The common shared belief, escaping from tyranny, promoting democracy, opportunity, and promoting this idea around the world and having the power to do so for good, and I know, of course, in the past it hasn't always been for good and it's often been misguided, has imbued Americans for many decades, I mean, ever since de Tocqueville first used the phrase in the uh, 100, 200 years ago now, they believe themselves to be exceptional. They believe themselves to be essentially a force for good. And I know this is a misguided belief often, and terrible things are often done in the name of this misguided belief. But they have the power to do so. And I must say, as a new American, after that devastating uh, typhoon in the Philippines, Haiyan, when the USS George Washington came in, the aircraft carrier with all its support vessels, and brought help, not asking for nothing in return. It reminded me that this is the only country in the world that can really, when it has to, can take charge and do good if it chooses to do good. It can do terrible things as well. And my hope is that, and I think it's something that I applaud Obama's belief, that yes, countries believe themselves individually to be exceptional, but America has the opportunity and the ability to spread that exceptionalism around the world if it does it in a well-intentioned way and for good, then I think it's a good thing. Okay, I want to read you something. This is uh, from Stephen uh, Walt. He's a professor of international relations at Harvard. Uh, he write, wrote about uh, the myth of American exceptionalism a couple of years ago. Here's what he wrote. This unchallenged faith in American exceptionalism makes it harder for Americans to understand why others are less enthusiastic about U.S. dominance, often alarmed by U.S. policies and frequently irritated by what they see as U.S. hypocrisy, whether the subject is possession of nuclear weapons, conformity with international law, or America's tendency to condemn the conduct of others while ignoring its own failings. Ironically, he writes, U.S. foreign policy would probably be more effective if Americans were less convinced of their own unique virtues and less eager to proclaim them. What do you make of his assessment? Well, it, it's, uh, I understand it. I agree with it to an extent. Were I to be a Secretary of State, were I to be President, were I to be in a position of authority, my views, I think, would be tempered by just what he's saying. But nonetheless, you look at the lines in almost any of the countries that are critical of the United States outside the American embassy, if there are indeed embassies in those countries, of people lining up to get visas, not simply to visit and go on holiday, but to join this great amalgam of people, because they, in very large numbers still, and this is a country built on immigration, I'm talking about America now, um, it attracts people. There's something about America which even its fiercest critics, many of them want to come along and be part of it. And that seems to suggest something about that analysis is wrong. Why, if America is so loathed, do so many people want to become Americans? Okay. I'm going to keep reading some of his analysis. Okay, okay here's another one from, from Walt again. He writes, America's past success is due as much to good luck as to any uniquely American virtues. The new nation was lucky that the continent was lavishly endowed with natural resources and traversed by navigable rivers. It was lucky to have been founded far from the other great powers, and even luckier that the native population was less advanced and highly susceptible to European diseases. Americans were fortunate that the European great powers were at war for much of the Republic's early history, which greatly facilitated its expansion across the continent, and its global primacy was ensured after the other great powers fought two devastating wars. Wars. This account of America's rise, he writes, does not deny that the United States did many things right, but it also acknowledges that America's present position owes as much to good fortune as to any special genius or, quote, manifest destiny. That's entirely the argument which he's obviously read Jared Diamond, who believes that geography and the propinquity of good weather and, and 
natural resources and everything that and he's mentioned. And good luck. And good, good fortune. But mm. I mean, why was Europe in the middle of turmoil and wars? The bickering that was going on in Europe. They, uh, look at Australia. Look at, look at Canada. Look at the Soviet Union. Other vast countries, huge amounts of natural resources. I know the Canadian climate is not quite as, as, as favorable. But other countries have been blessed with a similar amount of good fortune. I think it's a pretty cheap shot to say that America's only exceptional because of good luck. It's because of hard work, it's because of dedication, it's because of a sense of optimism. Steve Jobs is not a creation of good luck. It's because the country, the environment in which he lives, the system of government on which he operates, the amount of money that's available to him through universities, through grants, and through the marketplace, allows his ideas to catch fire in a way that they catch fire in a few other countries in the nation. So I think it's poppycock. So it's, it's beneficial to, to believe in American exceptionalism. It helps Americans grow. Yes, but tempered with a, a steady belief that exceptionalism can make you arrogant. And it has made America arrogant. I wouldn't for a moment deny that. But I think still that America is exceptional. And I think if this exceptionalism is channeled in the right direction, it can remain a force for good in the planet for years to come. Because no one is going to challenge. I mean, I lived in China for many years, and I'm about to write a book about the Pacific. China is not going to challenge America in a good way. I mean, do we want do we Chinese exceptionalism? Does the tyranny, the labor camps, the cruelty, the censorship, do we want that in the world to be the dominant force? I think not. When you were writing your book and, and you know, thinking about American exceptionalism as, as it exists in, in 2012, 2013, when you were writing your book, and thinking back to the days of the people in your book, I mean, can you, can you draw the line of the beliefs in American exceptionalism from them to, to modern day? I think so. I mean, funnily enough, I, I was struck by this when I was following the Lewis and Clark, um, when I was writing the early passage of the book. One of the places in Missouri, past which Lewis and Clark went and where they saw a particular snake and a particular turkey, because as I said yesterday, they kept these extraordinary notes about where they went and what they saw, was a place called Nob Noster, Missouri. Well, I had been, as it happens to Nob Noster, strange name, in the 1970s when there was a huge Air Force base there called Whiteman Air Force Base. And at the time, Whiteman was a detachment of Minuteman missiles. And I essentially knocked on the door of the base and said, I'm an English journalist and I'm here writing a, a piece. Can I come and have a look at these Minutemen? And, and you've probably seen from films like Dr. Strangelove, these amazing capsules underground with two impeccably dressed Air Force officers <laughs> sitting in chairs far, further apart from each other so that they, they had to do everything separately, turn two keys separately to launch the missiles, all these extraordinary safeguards in place. Nowadays, the base still exists, but it's a base for B-2 stealth bombers. And while I was there doing the research, one of these or two of these bombers actually took off on a seven and a half thousand mile flight to North Korea to do a practice run over an island to remind Kim Jong-un, who was behaving rather badly at the time, that America's watching you. Mm. So don't do anything silly towards our ally in the South, South Korea or threaten Japan and other of our allies. We have the power to deal with you if you attempt any funny business. And it occurred to me then that what Lewis and Clark were doing in pushing relentlessly westward with this sense of we can dominate this country, we can dominate, and it has to be said with some cruelty, of course, the Native Americans who live in this country, we can turn this country into something remarkable, that the echoes of what they did in the 1804-1805 expedition are still to a degree reflected by the feeling that America can send bombers to send its message anywhere in the world. And I said to myself, why America? Why does America feel it has any business in telling the North Koreans what to do? Well, it's all to do with the frontier and exceptionalism and manifest destiny. This firm and often misguided belief that the American way is the best way and that Kim Jong-un's way is not the best way and if he misbehaves, he's got to be warned that there are consequences. I want to quote one more person, and this is you. You close your book 
uh, by writing, this is what you say, cannot and should not be forgotten that the story of the United States is still a developing one, a continuing evolution, and that the union becomes ever stronger as a result of the pressures of steady change. We've spent an hour now talking, you know, about the past and a lot of about the nostalgia of the past. And it, it begs the question, I mean, to what extent does that nostalgia for the past hinder that evolution that you talk about in, in the close of your book? Well, I am I'm certainly I'm a historian of a sort and, and the past interests me. And those, of course, who ignore the past uh, do so at their peril. I live in a little village in Western Massachusetts and there was no newspaper there. It's a village with three rivers, it's separated geographically, the people don't talk to one another and I thought this is crazy. Let us start a monthly newspaper and free, it's transformed democracy in our corner of the world. I mean this may sound pretentious to you but the town meetings by which we run our government and decide on our taxes are held once a year in May at the town hall, maybe 10 people would turn up. Now we've got a newspaper, everyone's talking about the issues of the day, the town meeting is filled with people, most of the village come, there's argument, there's brouhaha, the police occasionally have to be called to calm arguments, and the votes that are taken are votes based on the informed knowledge of the citizenry. Same kind of information that Samuel Morse transmitted in 1847, the same kind of trans mission that when Marconi invented the radio in 1902 and this Canadian Mr. Fessenden invented in 1906. So the lessons of the past, which is to tell people what's going on so that they are informed and can make democratic decisions, still need bringing to little villages that have never enjoyed this. In the a part of America, two, two miles, 200 miles from, or 150 miles from New York City, so that phrase about towards a more perfect union, I feel very strongly about. America is imperfect. Democracy can get stronger, can get better. Things can still be created which help that progress. And I'm very proud that this little, little Mickey Mouse newspaper What's we it invented. Called? It's called the Sandersfield Times. It's available online, <laughs> Sandersfield, Massachusetts, the Sandersfield Times. And it's, it's the, a repeat of the kind of story that's happened all over America in the last 250 years. There's so much toing and froing in the United States now, politically about where the country's at, and internationally as well. And as America strives to be this more perfect union, you say, what limitations are there? Well, uh, very few, to be perfectly honest. I think the, the, you know, the, the dream is all, and I think the American dream still exists. I mean, I wouldn't bore you with a long story, but I brought the, the Filipina that worked for me in Hong Kong back to America with me. And they nearly denied her a visa, but she married. She's living in New Jersey. She has an SUV. She's been to university. The, I mean, she was living in a tiny village in the Philippines and now has four children, lives the American dream. And I'm so proud of her, Amy Cristobal, for, for doing that. So to her, America has no limits. To her, the dream of America has been amply fulfilled and it will be for her children because they'll be economically far better than her parents and indeed she was. So I think there are relatively few limits, but America has been knocked back in recent years. It's unpopular around the world for reasons that we've discussed. It has, lost, one might say, lost its way. There's the argumentative Congress, there's the Tea Party problems, there's there's a sense of a loss of direction. But I believe that America is better than her politicians and that the dream that Jefferson, who is my great hero, initiated in the last part of the 19th, uh, 18th and the beginning of the 19th century is a dream that America still cleaves to. So I believe in it and I think it'll go on. So no need for the, a new American dream. You're okay with the one that, that exists, exists? Jeffersonian democracy is the basis of the dream and I think it can be revived. I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming to Canada. Liked your book a lot. Can you come write one about all the great men and hopefully women that, you know, built our country as well? I would at some love point. to. I told you I love Canada. So <laughs> I can't I invite you on behalf of my country, but that would be a nice adventure for us all. Would Thank love you to very do it. much. Thank you, Peter. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.